I'm Richard Alexander. I am a member of Dallas Makerspace. I have an Associate of Applied Science degree in laser electro-optic technology, as well as a couple of other degrees in computer science and computer systems information systems. Uh, my interest is in lasers. I like lasers in general. All kinds of trying to build up enthusiasm at Dallas Makerspace for increasing our lasers, the type of the lasers that we have and the things that we do with them. Right now we just have one CO2 cutter, but I'd like to expand far beyond that. Today's lecture is on CO is on uh, gas lasers, just general gas lasers. And I'd like to talk about four types of gas lasers. First one, the helium neon. Second, carbon dioxide. Each of these have different physics behind what makes them work. But uh, you may remember from my last lecture, I mentioned it one time, uh, what is it that makes, so what, how do we categorize lasers? There's all kinds of different ways we can categorize lasers. It's kind of arbitrary. We can choose what powers them. There are lots of different things that uh, energize them. You can use electricity. You can use light photonics uh, optically. There's a, so you have electrically pumped, optically pumped, chemically pumped, chemical reaction can pump it. Actually, pretty much any energy source can be used to ignite off, light off a laser. Uh, nuclear reactions, you can use nuclear reactions. Uh, you can use heat. Uh, you can use the electron beam of an accelerator to light off a laser. All kinds of different things have been used. But the most common things that are used, electrically pumped, optically pumped, and chemically pumped. Pretty much in that order with electrically and optically being neck and neck, I would say. Uh, and it doesn't matter what kind of laser it is, because they can all do that. Semiconductor, we usually use electrical, but you can use an ion beam or optically to pump an uh, semiconductor laser. But we're going to look at gas lasers. Instead of looking at what excites the gas laser, we're looking at the active medium. That's how we're going to categorize these, or that's how I'm categorizing them. That's a, a pretty common way, maybe the most common way, so we're talking about. The optic active medium is some kind of gas. All of these are in gaseous states. The gas laser has some advantages to it. One of them is that uh, the gas is pretty much homogeneous, and therefore the beam can be pretty much homogeneous. It gives a pretty nice clean beam. Uh, can be stable. It also has some drawbacks. All of these are pretty much inefficient. Uh, quantum inefficiency. The helium neon. Uh, you can usually get. I think it's. 0.1% efficiency, 0.01% rather. Uh, carbon dioxide is an exception, so I'll skip that for a moment. The argon ion laser, uh, that thing I think runs around 0.7% quantum efficiency, not very efficient. I don't know what the efficiency of the nitrogen laser. Carbon dioxide is the one big exception here. It's typically about 30%, or at least tens of percent of units, 10 to 30. In fact, the carbon, dioxide, the carbon dioxide laser was for a long time the most efficient laser that we have. Um, the semiconductor laser since Lipstick. But each of these has a different mechanism that makes them work. Um, three. Anybody have a question? No? Okay. Pretty much all of them use other gases in addition. Uh, actually, in the helium neon, the active element is neon, so it's made a little misleading. Helium doesn't do anything for producing light itself. All of these have helium in them, so I can say helium carbon dioxide or helium argon ion. Nitrogen, you might have helium in there too. And a lot of these will also have nitrogen, so 
common gases that act as buffers or support are helium, nitrogen, in different ratios. And uh, these are used to help improve the efficiency of the laser. So uh, helium, uh, there's a lot of chemistry involved in this. You might remember helium. We have two protons and two neutrons. And then we have two electrons. If you remember from your chemistry class, this is your S shell. S shell. There you go. That's helium atom. I'm not going to do this for all the atoms because I don't remember them off the top of my head and I'll get something screwed up there. But your basic helium atom. And the thing is, is that helium is a Nobel gas, noble, noble gas. Which means that it doesn't like to react chemically for the most part. Yes. We used to say inert. Chemically inert, but it's not really chemically inert. You can make chemical compounds with helium. That's really outside the scope of this class. But uh, you, there are, there's a thing called uh, helium tetrafluoride. Fluorine reacts with pretty much everything. Fluorine is a really nasty gas. It rips the electrons right out of your body. And uh, it rips the electrons right out of helium. And helium is otherwise inert. But you put helium and fluorine in a container, and you uh, we just natural thermal processes, you get helium tetrafluoride. Really weird. It was discovered in the 60s or 70s. Anyway, but for the most part, helium doesn't do anything. It's a, just a small little atom, that, uh, monatomic, one atom. So what happens is an electron will come by, there's a little electron down here. Actually, it's physically quite large, a big wave down here. And this electron bounces off this helium atom and gets, his, gets it excited. Now, down at this level, we're working with quantum level, which means that things absorb or release energy only in, this, in certain specific values or quanta. Uh, not just any tone will work. And it's very much like on a pipe organ or a piano where a sound goes across and the strings resonate. These things have to resonate. So you have to have, this thing has to resonate with the, elect the energy of the electron. Increasing or decreasing the energy of the electron changes the resonance. That's what I'm going to call it, resonance. Can think of it as resonance. When it resonates with the helium atom, it gets the helium atom excited. Then the helium atom comes over here, and you have a nitrogen atom over here, and it excites the nitrogen atom. Eventually, it goes up to neon. Neon is another inert or noble gas. It's not really inert, but it's noble. We call it noble. Neon is the one that we want energized. The electron might come up here and energize it but not very effectively. I mean, it does a little bit. The helium come over here. The nitrogen come over here. So all these things bouncing off the neon. Get the neon a little bit excited into an upper energy state. And remember that I've mentioned the key to a laser is that you have to have a population inversion. Remember what a population inversion is. We'll go over that anyway. <laughs> Mention it because it is key. It's what makes a laser a laser. You can't have a laser unless you can get a population inversion. If you have a if you have a stove or an oven and you heat up a pot of water or anything, a bar of metal, the boundary over here, whatever, you just heat it up in a fire, the energy level can graph it. This is the energy level. Energy. temperature of all these atoms 
is the temperature of the material. So when we say that material is 100 degrees, it's the average of all these temperatures. And it's all going, you're going to have some that are down here, a very small number that are, you know, say absolute zero, which is impossible. And then you'll have a couple over here that are a million degrees. You might have one in there that's a million degrees. But the average is 100 degrees. In this room right now, you have particles hitting your body that are a million degrees. You have particles that are hitting your body at negative whatever. Uh, I don't know what the realistic temperature is, but the average temperature is uh, whatever, 76 or whatever. And the others, you, you don't really notice. Their, their energy is lost pretty fast. That's if you just see it. Well, this won't make a laser. This, you can't do that. It's like an ordinary light bulb. This is the, what you'll get with an ordinary light bulb or even fusion reactors. What you need to do, you need to get this energy distribution unstable into an unstable condition. You want very few down here as possible, we want as many as possible up here. So this is a population diversion because it isn't natural. Things don't like this. This is like stacking up sand, loose sand or water into a mound. When you do that, it's all going to want to pull back down this direction so that it can go back to that curve. But this is what you have to do to make a laser. So that's what we have to do with our neon or whatever in this gas. We get our population inversion, we get all of our atoms up here into an upper energy state. And actually what happens is uh, we have three, three level lasers and four level lasers is what we call them. I mentioned that in one previous lecture, and I should have mentioned that. Uh, let's start off with the four level laser. This is your all right, down here is your ground state. This is your ground state. This is where your atoms are. I mean, they're just in the out in the room where they're both in the We want to very quickly get everything up here. Okay, everything's energized here. Well, things leak out of here pretty fast. This, this, is, this goes, up, oh, goes away usually in a few seconds. It doesn't last very long. Then it drops down. We want it to drop down here. And this is going to be our key because this is our upper laser level. Understand, this is simplified because in a, right, in a real laser, there may be hundreds of these. Okay? So this is schematically what we're looking at, overall general view. You want to go up here, and it's going to decay down here, and it's going to hang out here. It's going to have a longer life. So this is in picoseconds lifetime, and this down here is going to be in uh, microseconds, maybe microseconds, nanoseconds, to microseconds, somewhere in there. And then all this stuff is just waiting. It's just like a, a tinder box, just like an explosive or something. You have all this energy and it's unstable. It's going to be a triggering event which usually we want to trigger the event ourselves. We don't want it to trigger on its own. We put a photon in there. And that photon, because of quantum mechanics, when that photon goes across here, there is a statistical tendency of photons to stick together. If it is of the right frequency, if it is of the right energy level, it will resonate with these atoms and it will trigger a discharge. You will end up getting a, uh, a chain reaction across here, where now where you had one photon, now you have two photons, where you had two, then you get four photons, and so on and so forth. Well, that means that these guys drop down here. They lose energy. Because the photons carry away that energy. Then they'll hang out here for some period of time. This is your lower laser level. They'll hang out here for a while, and they drop back down to the ground. And they have to get down to ground. They can't go back up from there. They have to drop down to ground to use use it again. And that's the cycle for a four-level laser. Four-level laser. Helium ion is a four-level laser. Carbon dioxide, I think, is a four-level laser. I'm pretty sure it's a four-level laser. Argon ion is a four-level laser. And actually, this one is the one that I was talking about. This being schematic, 
it's really schematic here. This thing actually has hundreds of transitions. This, 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 this is just a bunch. In fact, I have a diagram of some of those transitions. I don't know what's probably. These are the transition levels of the uh, argon ion laser. Uh, and you'll notice that next to them, if you can see it, it says 5S, 5S prime, 5P, 5P. These are atomic shell states, or they're, they're the energy levels that are associated with it. I told you that the helium, helium atom is, a, I showed you it has that S shell. There's also the P shell, and a whole bunch of other shells that I don't remember right off. P for terapolic, I say. Those are higher energy pump the, the atom up and it goes into those higher energy states and these are the corresponding states and they, they name them in there. Anyway, the argon ion laser has hundreds of those states, but we simplify it to this four level laser like this. Those upper states are only Except for this one. This one actually does ionize. And this one's kind of weird because of that. Nitrogen is different. It's a three-level laser. All these others are four-level lasers. Nitrogen's a three-level laser. You can just imagine how that works on here. I'm missing one of these levels here. It's only quasi three-level lasers. There are several three-level lasers, but I don't know what they all are. But it's kind of quasi three-level laser. If you really refine it, it looks like a four-level laser. But generally, you'll have the ground state, you have this upper metastable state. Metastable. where your population diversion happens on the nitrogen laser. And then it pretty much spontaneously super excites itself and drops down there. And this is such a large gap that it releases it as UV light, ultraviolet light. And then it stays here and this kills the thing because this lasts for a couple of milliseconds. I don't remember it was in the order of 10 milliseconds. That's not right, but it's around there. So it pumps up here, hangs out here, this thing completely depletes. This will be completely depleted before this stuff drops back around to, down to ground state. This has to drop down to ground state before it can go back up here. So we have a, we have, we get the stuff up here, we get our beam, and then the thing has to rest. So this can, the, that means that the nitrogen laser can only be operating in pulse mode. You can pulse it pretty fast, 120 pulses a second. Twice line noise is pretty typical. Uh, you can pulse it 200 times a second, maybe. You start pulsing it, it starts getting hot. When it gets hot, it doesn't work real well. That's pretty much true of any laser. When any laser gets hot, it doesn't like to work very well. They, they need to have the temperature stabilized. But these can operate in continuous mode or in pulse mode, depending on how you have the setup. That, that would be pretty.
told you how the helium neon works. The helium bounces off the nitrogen, and the helium and nitrogen bounce off the neon, and that gets it, gets it excited. It doesn't really ion, it doesn't ionize it necessarily. It just gets it into a, an excited state, just like a neon sign. At least pretty much a helium neon laser, very similar to a neon sign. Put, put an appropriate resonator, and you could uh, probably get some kind of a laser out. The thing is, is if you want to have a stable power supply, you do this. For most of these, it's important to have a stable power supply because if there's any kind of ripple in your electronics, it's going to propagate into your, into your optic output. Um, drop the pencil. You know? if, uh, if you have any kind of ripple in your power supply, it's going to propagate into your output of your beam, and that's usually just like a disaster. You don't want it. it it's noise on your system. Uh, carbon dioxide is very unusual. I've mentioned this in one lecture also. Carbon dioxide, of course, you have carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. Just like you would expect. The oxygen atoms are over here. And you can think of this as like a spring attaching it. What do you do with the spring? You can this up and down and bounce it around, one, 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 and move it in and out, one side, and move this up and down, in and out. You can rotate it around, so it's spinning around. Every time you do that, those are quantum maneuvers that I've mentioned before that you are accelerating electrons. When you accelerate an electron, it absorbs energy. Or when an electron absorbs energy, it accelerates. When an electron releases energy, or when an electron decelerates, it releases energy. So when something is spinning, it's accelerating. That means that it's going to be emitting energy at some wavelength. And again, it's quantum wavelength. That means, unlike a wheel, a wheel on your car, you want to drive from 50 miles an hour, speed up to 60 miles an hour, you can just press that gas pedal. It'll work that way down at the atomic level. You press that gas pedal and you'll be driving 50 miles an hour, and then you'll be driving at 53 miles an hour, and then you'll be driving at 58 miles an hour, and then you'll be driving at 62 miles an hour. And those are the only speeds you can drive at. You cannot, there is no in between. It's the same way with this thing. It can only spin at certain spin rates or vibrate, vibration rates, vibration modes. It has to have a quantum of energy, it has to be at a quantum level. And each of these is releasing light at some wavelength. The uh, predominant wavelength that is, I guess, most commonly used for carbon dioxide is 10.6 micrometers. Which is pretty much into the thermal infrared. Uh, you can tune it for other wavelengths, but that's pretty much the one to be used. And I don't know which vibration state that's associated with. These are all happening at one time, so you're getting all these, you're getting a whole bunch of other wavelengths in there, not just 10.6. You also get, I think, 10.3, a couple others. It bounces around there. 10.6 is sort of a center line there. So it's very efficient, but not a very narrow beam. So it wouldn't be so good for communicating on, but it's really good if you want a high-powered laser. Now, you can pump these things up. There's a thing called Q switching. I told you before that lasers are high Q devices. You can put energy into your optic medium. Pump energy in. And when the beam's going, the energy is coming out through the beam. But what happens if you put some kind of interruption here? It cannot bounce back and forth between these mirrors, these mirrors here, between the HR, high reflectance mirror, and your output coupler. Put some kind of an interrupter in here, and it can be just an ordinary shutter. It doesn't matter what it is. Anything that blocks the beam. But you're still pumping energy in. The only way energy can get out now is to heat. So you have some heat coming out, maybe a little bit of incoherent light coming out. You don't have a laser beam coming out, and that's the main way it's supposed to come out. So you pump this thing up. Now you open the shutter. It's called Q-switching, because now all of a sudden you have an avalanche of all that energy in there tries to go at one time. You, with the appropriate Q-switching, with the appropriate oscillators, you can get uh, terawatt 
terawatt to the team. Terawatt pulses out of there, out of the carbon dioxide laser. Uh, you can also get continuous mode in the 100,000 watt range, continuous. It's really good for high power, and it's inexpensive, it's stable, it's durable, and it's powerful, and it's efficient. That's why we have a carbon dioxide laser sitting out there on the floor instead of like a helium neon laser. <laughs> We're not using a helium neon laser out in that thing because it would never cut metal. I mean, not, we'd have to fill this whole, we'd have to fill this whole building up with helium neon tubes to get it powerful enough to cut the metal. Or is that thing only like two, uh, six feet long? I don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm probably going to be moving. We should probably be wrapping this up. Argon ion is different because it actually, you have to ionize the atom before you can use it. This one's visible 632.8 nanometers. Is the wavelength we usually want. The dominant wavelength of helium neon is actually infrared. And that the first helium neon was an infrared laser, but that's not too useful for us. So we make it. This is visible. This is red orange. Helium neon carbon dioxide is a uh, say 10.6 micron micrometers, or if you want 10,600 nanometers. Visible. Uh, it, well, it has it has a whole bunch. I told you about all those energy states it has. Because it has all those energy states, each ener energy state represents a different wavelength, different frequency, a different course. So it works at everything from about 700 nanometers. Actually, I think it'll go past. It does go past that. This thing will go up to uh, 520. It's a pretty common one. 520 nanometers. Pretty common wavelength that you get out. Anyway, I think we're all the way down in the infrared. If you have just a plain, uh, well, I'm talking a little bit about this operation, real fast, first you have to pump this thing up until the atoms actually ionize. You actually have to drive electrons off of this thing. So it takes a huge power supply. It takes like twice as much energy out of here. Typically, these things are going to run, I think it's like 47 volts across there, and they're going to run at like 50 amps. So you have a big, thick cable with these things. And you have, obviously, you're pumping a lot of wattage into a little tube. You could melt the tube, or a silicon usually is used, or a silicon tube. You're pumping a whole lot of energy in there, so this has to be water cooled. This is water cooled. The newer ones, you might get away with some forced air cooling. The newer ones use forced air, but water cooled is pretty common. Uh, this usually will be water cooled. If you, if you get uh, if you get some more efficient ones or lower power ones, you might get away with air cooled carbon dioxide. This one is air cooled. Air cooled. They're very small. Usually have this one will go from uh, 0 0.5 milliwatts up to maybe uh, I think the biggest you're going to get is like 20 milliwatts. And that would be a really honking huge helium neon. One milliwatt to 10 milliwatts is the normal range. I just ordered a five milliwatt off of eBay. I just ordered one to see if it works. I haven't gotten it yet. But that's the range. One milliwatt to ten milliwatts, that's pretty normal. Uh, carbon dioxide is going to be in the uh, tens, all the way up to terawatts. I mentioned tens of watts up to terawatt. Argon ion laser uh, usually runs around five to uh, thirty watts. Because the efficiency is so low to get thirty watts out of this thing. You're practically melting the glass 
you can't run a beer line, you have to water cool it, make sure your water cooling, you will destroy it if that water cooling is interrupted. Uh, nitrogen laser, this thing puts out 100 kilowatts, pretty typical. You can get up to one megawatt without too much trouble, about a, if you have it, it, it depends. The, the nitrogen laser is interesting, the longer you make it, pretty much you need them. The longer you make them, the more powerful they become. The bigger they, they, they are, the more powerful they are. A three foot long, a one meter long nitrogen laser can put out one megawatt pulses. These pulses last for 10 nanoseconds each. You don't have a whole lot of power coming out of that thing. Not a whole lot of energy coming out of it. You have a lot of power, but it's a spike. So uh, it's safe for you to get in the beam, although it is an ultraviolet beam. Very ragged, beam. but it doesn't. It doesn't have to be water cooled. You can water cool if you want. This is usually air cooled, though. Air cooled. All right, and uh, efficiency. Uh, let me think. I can tell you a number. All right, look it up. have this book. This book is out of print as far as I know. It's highly valuable to me anyway. Light well, is used as Scientific American. It's a collection of the uh, C.L. Strong's Amateur Scientist. Sure. Tell you how to make a whole bunch of different types of lasers. Codons of 3,371 angstroms. There's a new unit of measure that I haven't mentioned yet. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody got this and wants it? Electronics? Yes, electronics. Give me oh, a minute. Okay. Be next. Oh. If you guys want to look at the book, please be careful, treat it with respect. Angstroms, which is equivalent to 337.1 nanometers. use of a nitrogen laser is to act as a pump laser or a dye laser usually if you want to pump up your dye laser that's a really good one for it you just need an ugly ultraviolet beam coherent some semi-coherent radiation and a nitrogen laser is pretty good because it's inexpensive it's really cheap because it's one of the cheapest it's low tech Benjamin Franklin could have made a nitrogen laser he had the technology in his day to make it if he had thought of it doesn't take very much we might build one in here <laughs> anyway, any questions? Because I need to wrap up. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Let me know if there's anything else that you would like to have covered. Uh, I'm trying to get us to the point that maybe we could start working on actual stuff. I want us. Would you all like to have your own helium neon laser? Yes. Great. For $90, I've set it up with this guy. For about $90, we can put together a little kit. He has helium neon tubes and power supplies. Pretty much you just connect them together. You have a helium neon laser. He has a stand also. Uh, electronics. Yeah. Is this the electronics? Yes, basic electronics. I'm just finishing up lasers. Oh, you're doing the electronics one too? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, if I can get enough interest, I need to get a couple of them and then bulk order those things. And, and then we'll go on with other lasers also, semiconductor. And uh, maybe if we can all group together, we can get an argon ion or an ND YAG. Everybody wants to have an ND YAG. ND YAG is a solid laser, and uh, it produces light. Uh, 0.06 uh, 
microns. So I recognize that 10.6, that's how I remember it. This is carbon dioxide. This is NDEA. So it's 10 times shorter. You use it for etching metal. Everybody wants to have one of those. These things cost thousands of dollars, though. Argon ion costs thousands of dollars. You might get it down to hundreds if you find them scrambled. But I'd like for us to be able to do that. So I'm hoping that I can get everybody enthused about it putting those things together and we can experiment with it. We can do holography. That's the one thing that helium neons use a lot for, using them for holography. They're cheap and they're stable. What is that? Uh, holograms? Yeah, we can make holograms. Of course, you don't have to use not the helium neon anymore, but for a long time, helium neon was one of the more common ones. Or argon ion. Uh, and by the way, one thing I would point out, argon ion, there are a whole bunch of different types of ion lasers. Argon ion is one. Another one is krypton ion, uh, argon ion. One thing that I needed to mention, argon ion puts out, if you just run it, it has six wavelengths. And it will put out, if you don't do anything to it, but just have an, an oscillation chamber, it will put out six wavelengths of light. Okay. Uh, if you want to have one wavelength, which you often do, you would put either, you would probably put a prism in the uh, in the beam pack to do a two and a frequency select just one. Okay, so typically it's going to be blue green up here. Down here this krypton one. Uh, yellow green, okay. Well, yeah. Uh, there's six wavelengths. Uh, these things are labeled. It's like if you have a four watt argon ion, you will get two watts from its most powerful wavelength. And then there's going to be five other wavelengths in here that I don't have memorized. The summation of all six of these wavelengths is this four watt rating. So if you see a four watt argon ion laser, it's these six wavelengths combined. Kind of an important point there. Uh, krypton argon, uh, krypton ion is a uh, more red. You usually think it can work at other wavelengths, but because it's strongest, is in the red. So we usually tune it for red. All these ion lasers will both produce multiple wavelengths. Some, in fact, most of them will produce them, whether we want them or not, unless we do something like put this prism in there to tune it to just one wavelength. You can also put an etalon in to tune it. Anyway, that, that's just filtering out. Yeah, it's still going to produce it. Well, the thing is, is that if you have this plasma, if you have this prism in intra cavity, there's a difference between an intra cavity prism and an extra cavity prism. If it's intra cavity, it's only going to produce that one wavelength uh, because that's the only one that is uh, is able to amplify. I mean, the others, it'll still produce the others, but they don't amplify. They they dissipate real fast. This one is the only one that actually gets amplified this one wavelength, whatever you tune it for. If it's intracavity, if you put it outside and do it, tune it outside, yeah, it's producing all six wavelengths, you're still only getting that two watts out of your maximum one repeat value. You can get a little bit more power if you tune this intracavity because you're not getting these parasitic lines over here at once. Okay, well, I'm over time. I just wanted to mention that, meant to mention that, forgot to mention it, now I mentioned it. You're welcome. Thank you for coming.